since I am late, I'll give you 30 seconds. That's all the gratitude I get? Well, did everybody thank the Lord for air to breathe today? You know, it's amazing the blessings that we take for granted until God takes them away. And then we recognize all the good stuff we've had all along. Uh, so thank the Lord for that. And thank the Lord for clarity in his word. We are pleased, so pleased beyond words to have our brother Ted Tripp with us today. It has been a number of years since we've been able to have him here. He has been not idle over the course of his retirement, and we are very thankful that he had opportunity to come and be with us today. So we've been looking forward to this for a long time, and, well, been looking forward for a month. <laughs> so at any rate, we are glad to have him with us today. He will preach with us, uh, preach to us this, uh, this morning in our worship service. And on top of all of that, we've got the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. Please keep the gables in prayer as they struggle with the physical aspects of life and hold them before God. And thank the Lord for the opportunities that um, uh, I believe we have had. And I've got to confirm it before we announce it. Um, but um, um, at any rate, one of our friends, I believe, has been installed as a pastor up the road um, you know, this past week. So uh, I believe that is the case, but I didn't get the official word from him, so I probably should withhold his name. But at any rate, you would know him. Also, pray for Andrew Boozer. Um, uh, his house has sold in Arizona, apparently. The closing is the end of June, and you know how that goes sometimes. Um, but the uh, next point is to find a place here to move into. So make that part of our prayer request. So anything you want me to pray for, then let us pray. Our God and our Father, we want to bless your name for the opportunities of the Lord's Day. We are not here by our own will or choice. We are called here and summoned by your kind providence and your good will. We are grateful that you have designed to meet with us today, and we're thankful for your word, for in your word you live and the Holy Spirit breathes. So we ask that you would move among us. We pray for our brother, lead him, we ask by the power of the Holy Spirit to the things exactly designed for the consciences of your people here. And we ask, Lord, that you would use this day to sanctify our hearts for Jesus' sake. We pray in his name, amen. Head trip. Yeah, 20 of. Okay. You're fine. Well, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be with you today, and I'm really planning on you all teaching this class, uh, so I haven't come prepared to preach to you, but I want to lead a discussion and have us look at a passage of Scripture, a familiar passage, Mark chapter 10, and I'll read the passage, and then we'll talk about it together. Uh, I trust, or we'll have an awful lot of dead air. Uh, so, but I think we'll we'll be able to interact with this passage. It's the story of the rich young man. Uh, in Luke, it's called the rich young ruler, but it's the same story, uh, beginning with verse 17, Mark 10:17. <clears throat> As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. There is no one good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you will lack, he said, go sell everything that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. 
then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away very sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around at his disciples and said, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed, and they said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. In the context, if you look above, uh, Jesus has been teaching. Uh, people were bringing a little children to him. He was blessing the children. Uh, and uh, this, as he's leaving, this man comes uh, running up as Jesus is starting to go away. And he falls on his knees before him and asks this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So let's start there with what's he asking? What do you think he's looking for? What kind of an answer does he want? Any ideas about that? How, how, what other ways could you word this question? How much is it going to cost? <laughs> What's it going to cost? What do I have to do? Okay. Is there life after death? Yeah, is there life after death? Is there eternal life? Yeah. Yes. He has to do something. Yeah, what must I do? He has this focus on what, what do I have to do? And more importantly, how do I do it? How do I do it? Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? Could we say he's asking, how do I get saved? What do I have to do to get into your kingdom? What do I have to do to be one of your followers? Uh, and, you know, uh, what, what would we expect the answer to be? If someone comes to, to you and me and says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What are we going to say to them? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. We would, that's the counsel we would expect that would be given. Why do you think Jesus makes it about money? Because that's the idols of the world. Money is one of the idols that this man has. Okay. His greed. That's why he was, he was upset because I have so much. How can I possibly just give it all away? Yeah, so money, money is one of those. very hard for this. And maybe he has. We don't know the background story. Maybe he's the one that started from nothing and built it to something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. happens to a lot of people. It becomes very difficult for people to say, I'll just give it away. Yeah. Any other thoughts about why, why does Jesus make it about money? Maybe that's what he trusted in. I'm sorry? Maybe that's what he trusted in. Okay. Do any of us ever trust in money? Anyone here ever trust in money? <laughs> we use money. <laughs> we use money. Sometimes money uses us. Uh, but, but, you know, we worry about money, uh, don't we? I mean, I, I hear these news reports that they're going to make all currency digital. <laughs> and that means that the government can control how you use your money, and whether you're using it in the proper way or whether or not you bought enough gas for this week. And should you, you know, we worry about those kinds of things. We worry about money. Money, money is something we get preoccupied about. We worry about uh, the run, run on the banks. They say there's about 20% of the money that we think we have in our banks actually exists as currency, as money. Because all the money they supposedly print is not actually printed. I mean, it's just, you know, a, a statement goes into the bank that says there's dollar value there, but there aren't as many dollars as there are dollar values in all the accounts that are held by people, and you wonder 
What if, what if there was a shakedown and all of a sudden we had, uh, we were restricted. You can only withdraw $500 a day. That's the maximum withdrawal you may do from any of your accounts. Well, my, my point is we do trust in money. Uh, and money is something people trust in, something people hope in. Uh, are there any other things? You mentioned the word idols. I like that term uh, a minute ago. Money is one of those idols, just things we idolize. Well, what are some other things like that that we prize and value? Well, going back a little bit, um, his question is sort of a strange question because he's asking, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? But when you inherit something, it's not, you don't do anything to, to uh, mm. receive it. It's because of maybe lineage or mm. relationship. So uh, I don't know, just a thought. It's that's a, a good question point. To yeah. Ask. yeah, that's a good thought. I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, an inheritance is not something you do. Someone else does something to make it possible if you have an inheritance. You don't earn an inheritance. Uh, you don't do something. Someone mentioned, you know, what must I do? We don't do something to get an inheritance. That's an interesting, interesting observation. Thank you for that. So what are some of the other things that we trust in, we hope in? Uh, I mean, money, money is where we find hope, we find security. We have, we think, well, I have enough. You know, I have it. I think I have enough. I think I have enough. I'm 77 years old. I think I have enough that, you know, barring the unforeseeable, of course, that I'll, I'll be able to uh, to have my money outlast me. What about family? Okay. How, how, how's family? Can you expand on that? Yeah. Well, Jesus said if you don't hate your father, mother, your son, daughter, you can't um, be his disciple. So it must be some way to over-exalt the relationships that we love and care about righteously to the point of being unrighteous and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. detrimental to it. Yeah, because even, even good things can become inordinate things. Yeah. So you can want something that is good and valid, but you can want it in a way that is inordinate, in a way that says, if I can't have this, then I, I, I won't live. I can't live without this. Uh, we usually wouldn't say that, but we have, sometimes we have those kinds of fears, you know, that the, uh, if, if I didn't have my family, if my family rejected me, if, if my family was lost to me. Um, and that's one of the tests of idolatry, really, if you think about it. Any, anything in our life that we have that, you know, if this is taken away from me, in the absence of that, even God won't be a comfort. <laughs> God won't be enough if I don't have that, too. Uh, so yeah, family becomes one of those things. Yes? Um, social standing. He sure. was rich, he, he was a ruler, he was young. Yeah. So he obviously was doing something right or knew the right mm -hmm, people that mm -hmm, he was in a mm -hmm. position of power being so young and being able to <clears throat> have made some money doing it. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think this, this guy is kind of an extraordinary figure. He's uh, uh, morally upright, apparently, from the story. Uh, he's, uh, he's a young ruler. Uh, he has, uh, no doubt, has uh, people who he can command and give directions to. And he, uh, he's, he, yeah, he has this uh, prestige that comes with authority and influence and money. I mean, all those things, yeah. Yes? And taking back to our, our own pride, self-reliance uh, mm -hmm. in this selfie generation, yeah. Like yeah. And why does this, maybe we've, we've touched on this, but let's talk about it for a minute. Why does this young man walk away? When Jesus says, uh, sell what you have, verse 21, sell everything <laughs> and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. <clears throat> then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad. What? He was attached to his material 
I, I'm sorry, my old ears are having oh, trouble hearing. Because he was attached to his materials. Okay, he was attached, attached to that money that, you know, for the reasons we've just been talking about, the security that it provides and all of that. And so there's that uh, sense of, of, you know, if I'm weighing eternal life and this, you know, the, the money actually had more value. It tipped the scales further <clears throat> than eternal life. Yes? I think uh, Jesus showed his true worship and where his, where his heart was. Yeah, he put his finger on, um, on, on what really made life <clears throat> click. Is that what you mean? Because most of us don't worship money in the sense that we don't have statues to money or bow before money, but inevitably we do, you know, because, because we're worshiping beings. And, and when it becomes what we live for, it is an object of worship. And Jesus' comment as he walks away is such a profound comment. Uh, he says, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And, and the disciples are amazed at that statement. And so Jesus clarifies it further. He says, children, verse 24, the last part of it, uh, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, you all have, are church people, you have... Uh, You've thought about this, but but just let me first just look at the response to the uh, uh, of the disciples. How do the disciples respond when Jesus says this? How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. You're amazed. Yeah. I'm sorry. How, they, were, they were amazed. They were amazed. Yeah. They presumed that that's where the advantage is, that the blessing of God rested with rich mm -hmm. riches and authority and mm -hmm. all those advantages and sounds a little bit like they were counting on the power of man. Yeah. We were surprised that um, those advantages were nothing. Yeah, yeah. I, it's almost as if they're saying, if this rich man can't be saved... <laughs> Jewish people believe very strongly that if you were wealthy and had power, that you were getting the blessings of God. That's mm -hmm. why you that's why you strive for it. So mm -hmm. that's why I think the apostles kind of looked at it with that strange look like, wait a minute, that's contradictory to what we've learned from the Pharisees and Sadducees yeah, yeah. and so the teachers about being rich. And also rich people help the poor. You know? yeah. So this one man gives to the poor, but what about the next man? Yeah, I mean, I'm just speculating. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, and... I've got a question, Ted. Do you mind? Um, Peter's reaction stands out to me. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, see, we have left all and followed you as he parades all of his devotion to Christ and things. And Jesus closes his response to Peter in verse 31, many who are first will be last and last first. <clears throat> I'm wondering if something of Peter's in the same ballpark as this rich young ruler, and that he hasn't quite got a hold of mm -hmm. this whole matter of there is no one who's good. Mm -hmm. That's a question. Well, I, 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 I think you, I think you, uh, I think you're right. I mean, that's exactly the the the, the case. So this whole thing is meant to instruct the disciples as much as it is to dis instruct the rich guy. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Then, then, and they ask the question, you know, then who can be saved? If this rich guy, who has all this advantages, who has all this evidence of God's blessing, you know, on him, if he can't be saved, who can be saved? Now, our sister already led us into this a moment ago, but uh, what do we know about this young man from the story? But you can go ahead and just state the obvious. We know he's rich, okay. But what is age? 
I'm sorry? You know, they say he's young. The guy could be like in his 30s going yeah. towards his 40s. And yeah. Because the Jewish people didn't, they thought when you turned 40, the middle age mm-hmm. crisis, as we call it, that's when you really, mm-hmm. that's when you, you, know, you were respected more than before. But we don't know how old he was. Okay. Seems sincere. Yeah, he seems sincere. It's interesting when he says, I've kept all these from my youth. Jesus doesn't challenge him. Jesus seems to actually accept what he said. So I think we can we can conclude this. Uh, this was a extraordinary young man. Uh, he he was circumspect. He was respectful, uh, respectable. Uh, he was a law keeper. <laughs> he had you know given himself in some diligence to keep those commandments that Jesus uh, outlined for him. Uh, he. Uh, he you know, we're told in Luke's story, version of the story, he was a ruler. Uh, so he's an extraordinary uh, young man. Could he have expected it? I'm sorry? Could he have expected it? Expect- like, yeah, when you come up and you think, well, I have everything. What else do I really need? Yeah. You could just let me in. Yeah, yeah. Took it for granted, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Expected that, of course, God's going to be happy with me. I'm a, yeah. I'm a good catch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, he respected Jesus' authority. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, he wouldn't have come up and asked the question. Yeah, yeah, and calls him a good man and uh, teacher. The, uh, the problem is, though, he he had one command to obey, so all he had, <clears throat> and he disobeyed it. Yeah. So he had no regard for the lordship of Christ. Yeah. Now. In our culture, some people would say the fact he's wealthy is actually a strike against him, right? I mean, you know how people get wealthy. People get wealthy on the backs of poor people. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. <laughs> you, know? Uh, uh, you know, they take advantage of people. They, they amass wealth through cheating and lying and, and misrepresentation. And they exploit people and cheat others. And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, there are many <coughs> political figures in our culture who would say to be uh, wealthy is wrong. To possess great amounts of wealth is a, in itself a form of exploitation. And that's a, what's needed here is some uh, progressive taxation to redistribute the wealth. Uh, you know, so in our culture, you know, we don't we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we have kind of this love-hate relationship with wealthy people, don't we? So on the one hand, we admire wealthy people because they, through craft or hard work or industry or uh, maybe even denying themselves and making wise investments and so forth, they amass a lot of wealth and, and uh, you know, we tend to, on the one hand, admire them, on the other hand, we tend to think, well, they must have done something crooked, something wrong. But this, uh, the, the, uh, Jesus seems, seems to accept the statements that this man makes uh, about himself. And the disciples' response is, then who can be saved? If this man can't be saved, then who of us, which of us could ever be saved? Now, uh, what do you think this metaphor, the camel, means? Let's talk about this. Uh, verse 25 uh, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. That's verse 24, verse 25. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone to enter the kingdom of God. Tell me, what interpretations have you heard of that passage? What, how, what sense can we make of that? What's, what is this metaphor designed to say to us? I don't know about the wonderful design, but I did in many places, uh, especially at night, they would wall up the city. And if anybody came in at night, they would only have the gate at a certain distance. And the camel would have to get down, not necessarily in a prostrated position. Yeah. In order to get through the gate, they would pull them through the gate. So this way they could keep the gate closed to avoid any attacks by the enemy or, right, right, or right. those that were insurgents. <coughs> that was something that was practiced not even long after that by the Romans and so forth. But anyway, that's what I've read. Yeah, that's a, that's a fairly common interpretation of the passage. The, uh, I was reading on this and uh, one, one writer that I read said uh, 
that seems like a very plausible explanation. The camel gets down, the camels can crawl kind of on their haunches, the, you know, their, the way their legs are designed, they can crawl even. And, and the camel can work its way through this and, and so that's the eye of the needle. The cam and it's hard, it's hard to do, but if you squeeze and push and take some of the baggage off, you can get the camel through the eye of the needle. Um, one of the, the problems this writer that I've read uh, raised about that is he said there is no evidence that the, those smaller gates within the city gate were, were ever called the eye of the needle. So th that you would expect if that was a known interpretation of it that there would be evidence of that. Of, of that. Then some, uh, someone I read said it's a rope is what it means. Uh, the word for camel and rope are very similar and so it's a rope. Uh, and you're trying to put a rope through the eye of the needle, and uh, you know it's uh, kind of like the camel through the small gate. It's very, very difficult. It's hard to do. It's uh, <clears throat> but but if you if you try, if you get that rope, you know, and you wet it and you twist the end of it, and you hold the needle up to the light, you might be able to get that rope through the eye of the needle. It's really hard, but it's, you can do it. Uh, that's another common uh, uh, interpretation of it. Uh, and, but I want to suggest a different interpretation because I, I've, I've heard these, and you probably have heard those interpretations too. I, my, my thought is that the, uh, tell me what you think of this, that the metaphor is designed to say it's impossible. <laughs> and that really actually fits the passage because uh, the bystanders say, then who can be saved? <laughs> it was like going, putting a camel through, the, you know, and, and we have phrases we use that, uh, that talk about that idea of, uh, uh, of uh, something being impossible. He doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell. I mean, that's one of those phrases. You don't think, well, Maybe he has a little bit of a chance. I mean, maybe it's a really big snowball and not a real hot spot of hell. I mean, you know that phrase just means there's no chance. It's impossible. And I, I, I think that that fits the passage to say, really the passage is designed to say it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, of course, affirms that. With God, with man this is impossible. With God all things are possible. But apart from God, none of us are going to be saved is really uh, the point. But why is it uh, impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? What, what is it about riches? Yeah, it's interesting, the urgency, he runs up to Jesus. So he recognizes something in Jesus that might help answer a question that's been burning inside him. I've got all of this, but it's not enough. Here's somebody who I think can answer the question that I have. And Jesus' answer to him, you know, why do you call me good, first and foremost? Mm -hmm. I like, I've heard this as a, as a means to talk to a Jehovah Witness who denies that Jesus is God. You take him to this passage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus' response is, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And the Jehovah Witness is right there with you. You then ask, is Jesus good? Because you have to answer yes or yes. So therefore, it enforces the fact that Jesus is God. Right. But I just, <coughs> he's trusting in his efforts and his merit, his wealth. He's trusting in, like many people think, before God, I'm pretty good. Mm -hmm. I haven't done this, that, or the other thing. And, you know, the scale mentality, based on my goodness, Jesus is going to, I'm going to inherit eternal life. And Jesus just kind of blows that idea right out of the water. And I think what you said, you know, Jesus stresses it's with man, it's impossible. There's nothing you can do in and of yourself mm -hmm. to inherit eternal life. God yeah. has to do something. Hmm. I was reading this guy called, I'm sorry. Would he be referring to election there? Do you think, or? I'm sorry? Would, you, would he be referring to election? That's with, um, in other words. God must initiate this. Right. Yeah, right. It's only through a sovereign God that any of us will be saved. That's a, certainly is a truth, yeah. Another, yes? Um, I was just thinking, uh, Wayne had said something you know about inheriting, 
And it's almost like the rich young ruler was asking, how can I buy my way into heaven? Because I've already done all this other stuff. I've already kept these commandments, and I've already, you know, given to them. I've already done all this other stuff. So it was almost like he was saying, how much is it, how much do you need the check to be written for? And that's, I'm wondering if, too, that's like, that's kind of a, a rich person's mentality. I, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I would think, you know, well, I've got all that everything else. Let me just write it. Money. Yeah, yeah. Buy my way. Right, right. And that kind of fits in what must I do uh, statement. You know, I was reading this. Uh, this this is, may seem somewhat controversial. I suppose it is. But uh, I'll just throw it out in, uh, at no extra charge. Uh, I was reading this, uh, this uh, missiologist, a uh, man named Andrew Walls, and uh, he points out something very interesting. He says, most world religions stay in the place of their founding. So the Middle East is, the, is where Islam began, and to this day, it is the center of Islam. And, uh, you know, Asia, as you know, uh, is associated with Buddhism and Taoism and, and India with Hinduism, and those religious tend to stay in their place of origin. But Christianity is entirely different. Christianity is always migrating, and it's always migrating to the margins, mm -hmm. to the places where there are marginalized people, and poor people, and needy people, and that's where Christianity grows and flourishes. I mean, even in our day, uh, Christianity is flourishing in much of Africa. And, and in much of Latin America, and even in China, which, you know, we think of China as a wealthy country, and I suppose it is, but if you get outside the major cities, there's an enormous amount of poverty in China. And, uh, and so, so that it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, Christianity seems to thrive where the marginalized people are. In a, in a it makes me think about the Gospel of John where Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman, where he says you will no longer be worshiping here, but basically saying it could be anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, wherever I'm worshiping spirit and truth, not just in this place, right. on this mountain. Yeah. But so it's, it, if, if Walls is right, then these observations bear on one of the points of this story that, that wealth and power can blind us to the radical message of the gospel and, and the message of sacrifice and grace and pouring out uh, one's life uh, is lost over time unless we're continually being renewed by the scriptures and by the spirit of God working within us we lose sight of those things so We've, uh, we've reflected on this a little bit already, but he says, good teacher, what must I do? And as uh, some of you pointed out even at the very beginning of this uh, class, what must I do? Uh, anyone who's trying to do enough to be saved will always be left with that question. What must I do? How big, how big does the check have to be? Uh, what does it take? Uh, uh, how do you know when you're good enough? In other words, if you're if you're saved by what you do, how do you know when you've done enough to be saved? Uh, I, if I remember right, it was the end of Saving Private Ryan. Uh, Ryan, I believe Private Ryan is in the cemetery, and he's looking over the headstone of uh, one of the men who was involved in his rescue attempt, and he asks his wife, did I do enough? Mm -hmm. Was I a good enough man? Mm -hmm. And again, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty powerful scene yeah, to yeah. contemplate what that man is actually asking. Yeah, yeah it's a very poignant question. Uh, here's yeah. somebody who gave their life so that I might have life, and did I do enough for the life that was sacrificed so that I might have life? Again, if we take that in reference to the gospel, you know, as Christians, we would ask, uh, I think sometimes, you know, am I doing enough for my Savior? Am I living a life that's worthy of the sacrifice that he 
So when Jesus says to him, if you want to get into the kingdom, you've got to sell all that you have. It's interesting. He doesn't just say divest of 20%, 40%. Mm -hmm. Cut it in half. Uh, whatever. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. And then come and follow me. Um, can we think of other ways to word that? Other ways to talk about that? Jesus is saying, if you want intimacy with me, if you desire eternal life, this is what it's going to mean. How can we, how can we talk about that other than using the word sell everything that you have? What's he putting his finger on? Um, well, <clears throat> to me, like when I read this, it just it seems like there's two different worldviews going on. So like Jesus is trying to get to the point that a biblical worldview is um, knowing and believing and having faith that Jesus is who he is, but also believing that everything in the world is passing away. And it's interesting that he, he tells him you still lack one thing, sell everything and distribute it to the poor. And then he offers him treasures in heaven, and he like walks away sorrowful. So it's like, it's like contrasting two different worldviews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a way to say that. I think you're right. I think you're you're you put your finger on something very important. If you want eternal life, even your relationship to your good things has to change. Uh, it's going to be uh, where you're going to find your joy, where you're going to find your security, what's going to give you hope, uh, what's going to give you peace. Uh, and Jesus is putting his finger on that treasury. Well, and I think that's why he starts it off, too, where he says, why do you call me good? Because that's another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like worldly mm -hmm. and biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. The biblical word, worldview is that, or the biblical view is that God is only good. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting he started off with that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, basically what you, I was going to say what you just said, Forsa surrendering and forsaking everything. Um, security, anything you're anchoring your hope and security in besides mm -hmm. the Lord. Because mm -hmm. yeah, your treasure, whatever it is you treasure, it's what you take pride in. It's where you find personal security. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's where you find joy. And Jesus is saying to him, you've got to give up every other treasure, mm -hmm. Lori. Maybe it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, it's a very mm -hmm. <clears throat> profound expression of that uh, Shema. Yes? He's not, <clears throat> I don't know, he's not saying you have to subject yourself to a life of poverty. Uh, you know, we know that wealth is helpful in certain mm -hmm. things, and, and it's not wrong to be wealthy so long as you want it honestly you know, fairly, you haven't broken any laws. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's, it's a matter of position, what's first and foremost. Because again, wealth can be used in a very sure. helpful way. You can sure. say, you know, if money can solve all your problems, well, then you have no problem. Yeah, it, an illustration of what you're saying is, uh, you know, is that in uh, 1 Timothy 6, Jesus says, uh, charge those who are wealthy in this present age not to put their hope in riches which passed away, but to put their hope in God, to be rich in good deeds, willing to share, and so forth. If, if, so it's not saying uh, charge those who are wealthy in this age to divest. So Jesus is not giving us here a statement that this every Christian must divest of everything. Right. That's not the point of this story. But I think the... Uh, but the... the, the <laughs> Because I think that passage in Timothy is very interesting because it, it doesn't say divest. It says... Don't put your hope in riches. Well, if you divest, you're not going to put your hope in riches because you've divested. <laughs> it says, don't put your hope in riches. And so it also is supposing that you retain some use of your wealth because be rich in good deeds, willing to share, and so forth. So I, I certainly I think you're right uh, that the point of the story is not no Christian can have any money. I think when you look at... Um 
that you parallel Job and this Retrieving Ruler, I think you can see where, like the heart of Job and his, where his money lied and where this rich young ruler, I think Job can live without that money and he proved it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think. Yeah, the Lord gave, the Lord takes away, yeah. blessed be the name of the Lord, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think what Jesus is saying to this young man, see if this makes sense, is he's saying, you must be my, I must be your treasure. I must be that which you value above all other things. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, you can have no treasure that makes your life work plus me. <laughs> uh, I must be your treasure. And uh, uh, now, if you think about it, I was thinking about this. How could, how could this young man have responded? I mean, we know the story. He walks away sad. What if he had said, had turned to Jesus and said, uh, you're all I want. You're all I need. Uh, if I have you, that's treasure enough. And nothing else matters to me. I have you, and you're the only treasure I need. To have you, to have your forgiveness, to have your grace, to have your acceptance, to be your beloved, to be in your kingdom. <clears throat> That's life. <laughs> nothing else matters. I mean, if he had responded that way, he would have been in the kingdom. But instead, he walks away sorrowful. It's interesting, I was struck with this, uh, look at this passage, the, uh, the, the word that's translated, the NIV translates, I think rather weakly, he walked away sorrowful, but uh, uh, it's the same word that is used in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was deeply grieved in his spirit and crying out, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Uh, it was that deep grief, that anguish of spirit, realizing that uh, uh, he was facing the loss of everything. He was not only facing, in the garden, the loss of his life, he was also facing the loss of, of the Father, the Father with whom he had enjoyed fellowship from all time. And that bearing the sins of God's people was going to mean a break in that relationship in, in, in which he cries out, as we know, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The, the, so that uh, it's, it's a very strong word. The, this, the, the grief this young man felt was that a very, very powerful, pervasive kind of grief uh, that washed <coughs> over him. It was, agony because his money was his center it was his life and imagining facing the loss of that produced in him the same emotion response emotional response that it produced in Christ when in the garden he wept great drops of blood and cried out in grief and he was overwhelmed with grief so overwhelmed that he needed angels to come and minister to him so he could make it to the cross and the reason he was, this man was sweating and grieving is Jesus had touched his treasure. And money is one of those things we trust in. It's one of those things we hope in. It's one of those things we look at and we think, this will give me joy. Yes? I do. For me, I go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said in the first beatitude, Blessed are the poor in spirit. We give all of our allegiance mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. don't bank on anything, mm -hmm. the let alone riches, idolatry, family, mm -hmm. all of those are mixed in. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Lloyd Jones, I like what he says in that passage. He says the poverty of spirit is really turning to God and saying, I am nothing, I have nothing. Without you, I stand in need of all things. It's that utter poverty. That's really what Jesus was leading him to. I think um, 
come and die um, strikes me. But um, I remember when I was a teenager reading Walt Chantry's book on this passage, today's gospel, authentic mm -hmm. or synthetic, mm -hmm. and how he used this to talk about the necessity of repentance. And I remember it struck me like a truck. Um, the <coughs> claims of Christ are absolute and total, and that there is nothing that we can bring, nothing that we can offer um, that is of any value or of any worth. That real repentance is total dedication and commitment to one person and him alone. Mm -hmm. And having that word faith alone sink in in that kind of a way is mm -hmm. a life-changing mm -hmm. kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. Monica talks about world views. Um, this whole matter of the sufficiency of Christ and the solitary saving power of Jesus Christ alone. I think that's a foreign language so often to us by our mm -hmm. flesh. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And you know, I think, David, we get insights into that. Yeah. And we see it sometimes yeah. and we're moved by it and we're filled with joy and tears and humility. And we never after that have a proud thought. <laughs> no, I mean, we, 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 we slip in and out of it. Yeah. That's that worldview issue. You know, we slip in and out of it. We slip back and forth. And we, we have sometimes we're persuaded, God, you are all I need. You're all I want. If I have you, I have everything. There's nothing else for me. And, and then we are utterly disconsolate because someone keyed our car. Yeah. And, you know, the, the textual contrast here is with little children, and the first shall be last, and the, it's all against pride, and there's so many aspects to pride, mm. it takes a lifetime to sort it out sometimes. Mm. Monica's got a question. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. So I remembered what I was going to follow up the worldview thing with, was, like, the end here where he says, the things which are impossible with man are possible with God, that's like the gospel right there, because sure. that's the reason, that's the... That's the differential uh, key there between the two worldviews is mm -hmm. the people who live in the world can't see right, mm -hmm. what the Spirit can mm -hmm. show you mm -hmm. if you know Him. Mm -hmm. yeah, Only to. God can reveal that. Right. Yeah. That's why He says yeah. nothing is now, I, impossible with man or possible with God. Yeah, I was thinking about something just backtracking a little bit when you say what would happen if the rich and the ruler would have given up everything for Christ. I was thinking, it made me think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who is this tax collector, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that he would, if Christ would have asked him to give up everything, he would have, but he didn't. He would, he told that if he missed, mm -hmm. you know, if he did wrong to anyone, he paid back fourfold. Yeah. I think it was the heart issue, and this man sure. didn't have the heart issue with Zacchaeus. Sure. And I think that corresponds with what you were saying, Chuck, in the even the second Timothy, the first Timothy six passage. You know, that it's not. The point of the story is not that we can't have any wealth. The point of the story is that Christ must be our wealth. <laughs> he must be the treasure. Yeah. Now, I want you, but I want to, I want to try to connect this because this, this came to me as a revelation, and it, it totally <laughs> changed this story to me. And maybe it's something you've already observed. I want to try to connect this story to, to the story of the Bible. And it says, Jesus loved him. Jesus understood this man. Mm -hmm. uh, he, un he understood the thoroughly the temptations of wealth and power and status and relationship. Because if you think about it, Jesus was the rich young ruler. We know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians says, that he who was rich for our sakes became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. Jesus is the rich young ruler. The one who understood profoundly what it means to turn your back on on everything else, he humbled himself utterly and took on the form of a servant. It's, it's what Paul rhapsodizes about in, the sec, in, in second Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who didn't even consider 
equality with God, something to be grasped, but humbled himself, made himself nothing, and was obedient, even to death on the cross. It just struck me that Christ understood the incredible attraction of maintaining a position of wealth and power and status. He had been adored by dazzling creatures throughout all eternity. And so Jesus, the rich young ruler, understood this rich young ruler <coughs> and loved him with a kind of compassion and grace uh, that only someone could have who, for whom that was their experience. Uh, and he, he left it all, he gave it all away. Uh, he had more wealth than anyone could imagine, and yet he plunged himself into the deepest poverty. He sold everything for the poor. And so Jesus is now only telling us about the rich young ruler who walked away sorrowful. But he's also telling us about the rich young ruler who made himself poor for us. Uh, and, and I think that our hearts have to be melted by that. We've got to see him as this one who laid it all down for us, who was self-empty and walking as we sing one of the hymns, walking through life's hard way, homeless, sighing, weary, uh, weeping over sin and Satan's sway, carrying all the burdens of our sin. And if, you're, you're, if our hearts are melted by that, and we truly see the rich young ruler, then our money just becomes money. Our, the other things we treasure. Our family just becomes family. It's important, it's valuable. And, and we, we are, are the respect we get. I mean, we want to be respectable people. I mean, being respectable is one of the quali qualifications for office in the Church of Christ. It's good to be respectable. But being respected in the eyes of others just becomes it, it, it loses its luster. It, doesn't, it, it no longer is life for us. Uh, it's a blessing, but it's not life. And Jesus is the ultimate rich young ruler. And uh, it's only as we see it that that uh, we will be willing you know, to have our money just be money. To have our other blessings just be those blessings. I think of the hymn, I'd rather have Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it just says it so well. Yeah, yeah. And how this rich is untold. And yeah, he yeah. He came to a vast right. domain to be mm -hmm. held in sin-stretched life. Amen. You know, that be our, our mindset. You know, I'd rather have Jesus than all of this world has to offer. Thank you all. I came with some fear and trepidation because I wasn't sure if you would interact with me because I have not been in the science school class. You did a great job interacting, so thank you. They're, they're, they're well used to uh, engaging like this, so that's a good thing. But let me lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you for this story that shows us the rich young ruler, the one who, who, uh, who didn't walk away but who walked into our world, uh, lived in flesh like our flesh, faced all the struggles of life in this broken and fallen world, and did so without sinning uh, so that we might have righteousness. And we thank you for his sacrifice of atonement for us on the cross. We thank you that, as John says, uh, if anyone sins, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but for all the sins of the world. So we thank you that Jesus has come into this world, uh, divested himself in order to live with us so that we might live with him. We pray that our hearts would be melted by that. We ask this for Christ's glory. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat>